Hi, my name is Arlene with WA50 Plus, and I'm going to continue to expound a little bit more on the videos that I did about a month or so ago on the narcissistic personality. And um, about two, two and a half weeks ago, actually, I went to a gathering. It was a party, kind of combination birthday and retirement ceremony. I had gone out with this individual a couple of times, and he invited me to go to his home where he was going to have this event. And uh, I thought it was a little bit odd that he would invite me since we had only seen each other twice. And you know, I was still at a point where I wasn't sure if this was gonna go any further. But nevertheless, I went and it was very nice. He has a, just a stunning home and um, his friends were very, very nice, very personable, uh, very embracing. And we, it, it was just a beautiful day. I had a wonderful time. I met a lot of people. It was just great. And towards the end of the evening, people were, began to leave. And uh, I stayed behind because I figured, well, I might as well just at least help clean up. So I did that. And, and by the time we were done, I was really, really, really tired. Um, this was a Saturday. I'd had class that morning. I had been at his place most of the day. I was exhausted. I was really tired. So I told them that I was going to go home. And I thanked them for inviting me and, and that I was very impressed with his friends, etc. And uh, But he seemed a little bit annoyed. Um, so I kind of brushed it off. But then it, it, it just, uh, I was curious. So when I got home and I texted him and again thanked him for inviting me and having me over, etc. I asked him if everything was okay and he essentially said that he was disappointed and a little bit upset that I did not stay. Um, and of course he was alluding to the fact that I, he wanted me to basically stay and spend the night. <clears throat> so I, I texted him back and I said, well, um, we've only seen each other twice. I think this will be the third time. And uh, as I explained, I was really tired. I really wanted to come home. I had something going on the next morning. And I explained that I wasn't, I was still unsure about our relationship. Uh, we just getting to know each other. And I thought my reply was, was very reasonable. Um, I liked him just fine. And his reply to me was, well, I am sorry if you are repressed. I was shocked and uh, I didn't know what to say. So I did not say anything. And two days went by and um, I heard from him and he said um, something to the fact, I hope you're not upset. Would like to see you again. Would you like to have dinner? No, no acknowledging of the fact that what he said was offensive. It was um, demeaning. It was, um, and it should have at least began his text and his communication with me with an apology. That never happened. Needless to say, um, he is not someone that I really want to spend too much time with if he doesn't see the need to apologize for a comment that was totally unacceptable and out of line. And when it comes to a narc or a narcissistic personality, when you try to maintain boundaries, they will begin to get very upset. They accuse and they will shame you. They are great when everything is good, when everything is going fine, when they're happy. But as soon as you hit a wrinkle on your relationship, um, something that causes a little bit of a uh, upheaval, if, if you want to call it that, uh, or you say no, or you give them any kind of expression of no, their reaction is not to first dialogue and try to understand and try to reason. The first reaction is to be cruel, to be sadistic, to shame. They are extremely judgmental. 
and they will attack your character, your integrity, they will use the misdirection technique. Well, the only reason you are doing this is because they will strike at your self-esteem and they are relentless and they will mess with your head. They will judge you as not being as good as you promised to be and then punish you for it. You're a liar. You're deceiving. You deceived me. And now I am a victim of your deception and you must pay. They will and they do feel like they are the victims. Um, they are great at mind games. And yes, I'm reading some notes that I wrote to myself because I don't want to go on rabbit trails. <sighs> like rabbits, they multiply, you know. And um, they are great at mind games. Their focus is always to be right. That is the only thing that makes them happy. If they can feel in control, it helps them to feel settled and centered. So it's not a relationship, it's a game. And they must be right every time. This is why they justify everything. Every bit of behavior, anything that they may have done, even if they have wounded and hurt someone, they will justify it. Now, in my uh, in the videos that I uploaded, I share about things that I experienced personally. And there are two things that I did not address that are lacking in the narcissistic personality, and that is separateness and empathy. Empathy. Now, for them, it's very hard to maintain separateness and feel connection at the same time. They cannot feel empathy for someone and remain in whatever state they were. Um, for example, and, and you have to you have to remember that empathy is is the lack of empathy is the cornerstone of a narcissistic personality. They lack empathy. They can mimic empathy. For the most part, they may have a degree off but they do not have the large capacity of empathy that a average person does. So the lack of separateness is an issue. For example, if I am feeling fine, I am having an okay day, a good day, and you come to me all of a sudden out of the blue with upsetting news about a relative, a family member, someone, something that is very upsetting, you're crying, or you're upset, you're angry, I am able to empathize. I am able to have compassion. I am able to talk to you and try to make you feel better and try to give you uh, perhaps a different perspective and still remain myself uh, happy, still remain in peace, still move on to have a good day. A narcissistic personality cannot do that. If they're doing well and you come to them with something that completely disrupts their peace and their well-being, they get very agitated. Um, they, they, to them, it's almost like a personal attack. Um, they cannot deal with something that disrupts. Um, now, they are also very self-referential, and by that I mean that everything uh, they see and they view through the lens of self. How does this affect me? How is this going to benefit me? Um, your problem that you are putting in my lap is upsetting me. Can deal with it. Please take it away. And the way that they respond is by attacking back. How dare you disrupt my day? How dare you tell me about this? How dare you confront me with this? Uh, please go away because you're aggravating me. They can hurt people and completely lack the weight of remorse. They don't feel bad and there is no guilt. Now these emotions are in the conscience 
and their conscience does not work like a normal average person. It's interesting because it is in the conscience where we have the ability to create emotional attachments, but because they lack this ability to empathize and connect, people aren't more objects that they are human. They do not like when you try to set boundaries. Um, they try to break those boundaries. And when they do, they will justify what they did. And they want you to, they want you to see how they are right. Meaning, me um, crossing this boundary of yours was justifiable. It was an okay thing. And I want you to see it the way that I see it. One of the things that we end up doing when we sense the other person is manipulating and it's controlling, uh, when they are shaming, when they are attacking your character, your integrity, um, your values, is that we second guess our intuition. Uh, we rationalize. And let me just say that our soul knows when something is not right. Um, I found myself closing down, shutting down, um, you lose your joy, you lose your spark, you feel like you have to walk on eggshells, fearing something you may do is going to trigger that person to become upset or agitated or just have an unpleasant reaction. Now the lack of empathy makes them unable to relate with your feelings and your humanity. It becomes an inconvenience. Um, and it's interesting because I went to dinner with a friend and he is, uh, he is involved in, in research of human behavior. He's a scientist with Emory here in Atlanta. And he asked me, because I was sharing with him about um, uh, my marriage, my first marriage, a couple of people that I have dated, even someone in my family, friends that I have, that have these traits and he asked me what was it about these individuals like your first husband that drew you to them uh, or to him and I thought you know that is a really really good question because I have been thinking about that that morning actually and what drew me to my first husband was the fact that even though he was very young compared to all of the other guys that I knew at the time he seemed to have more of his life under control. He seemed to have a vision and a plan for the future. He was very responsible when it came to finances. Um, he had a clear uh, plan, a clear goals. And uh, being as young as I was and wanting to one day marry and have children, and, and have a family, I wanted to find someone who, not only was I attractive physically, of course, but I wanted to find someone who had some sense of a maturity, even though we were all in our, in our early 20s. And he was that way. So when I met him and I saw those wonderful qualities that made me safe, feel safe, or gave me an illusion of feeling safe, because of his maturity and the way that he was responsible with his life and finances and um, and not being careless uh, with with money, etc., and having just a great great plan for the future, uh, that made that gave me an illusion of safety. But it wasn't until after. No, I will say even before we got married. I saw a lot of things that should have made me pull back, but I didn't because I rationalized. And um, and when that happens, you almost wish, because they blame you for everything. Uh, whenever there's an issue, they blame you for it. And at the time, I almost wish that I was indeed the responsible party. I wanted to be the problem because I figured if I am the problem, I can fix this. You know, I can change my attitude, I can change my behavior, whatever it takes to make this relationship work, I will do so. But it wasn't all me. Um, 
and the more that I try, the worse it got, and the more I was blamed. So, as shallow as this may sound, you know, if you are looking, if you are wanting to date, etc., as shallow as this may sound, if there's any doubt, if there's any suspicion that someone may have a personality disorder, you may want to find out you may want to find out if there's a sense of empathy and there's many ways that you can do that you know and just just watch for the reaction just watch for the way that they respond why because we all have the right to peace of mind we all have the right to be happy to have a future, to have hope of a future, of a good relationship that is healthy, that is safe, that is uh, one that is based on respect and caring and thoughtfulness, mutual admiration, where you can dream together, where you can work together, build together, and move forward together. But there has to be that, that that appreciation, there has to be that acknowledging when one party does something that upsets the other. And I've always said that I am sorry are the most powerful words that you could possibly utter to mend, to restore and repair a relationship. You can tell me all day long that you love me. If you cannot utter the words, I am sorry, I love you doesn't mean the same. It just doesn't have the same weight. You have to utter the words, I am sorry. It is the only thing that heals a heart. Whether or not the, um, the offense or the transgression was meant or not. You may not even be aware that you did or said something that hurt the other person. But if the other person was hurt by something that was said or done, we should always say, I'm sorry. And I, I was sharing this with someone at work and that person, of course, gave me the, well, love, love means never to say I'm sorry, right? We say that, okay, I've heard that many times. That was out of a movie, a Hollywood movie, where you know very well how relationships go in Hollywood, correct? Okay, that was a movie. It was not something to base your relationship upon. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Love means that you say you are sorry immediately. You try to bring restoration to that relationship. You try to bring it around. Don't sleep on it. Don't wait long. Just do it. It is one of the most wonderful, packed with integrity and honor, kind things that you could possibly do for someone. I am the easiest person to get along with easiest person and I will say I'm sorry if I know you're hurt if I think you're hurt I will say I'm sorry um, if I know it's going to turn things around if it's going to repair if it's going to heal your heart it is not a difficult thing to say it doesn't take away from me if anything it adds to me so with this I leave you and um, I hope that it, this helped you. Um, never get into an argument with a narcissistic person because they do not argue. They basically just shut um, their ability to reason and rationalize. Um, they just want to be right every time. This is why they justify their behavior every time. So don't argue. Just state your case and walk away because they cannot be reached. They just cannot be reached. I thank you if you're one of my subscribers. If you're not, welcome to my channel. I hope you do subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.